I, I just want to go through this slide and just tell you, you know, how to read it. <laughs> uh, the, the, the stuff in the middle, the RISC-V ISA and the golden model and architecture tests are things that RISC-V actually does. We have it in our GitHub repo. We manage it, okay? And, um, you know, again, it's still contributor culture. Folks are, are doing the work. Development partners are helping with this work. But this is something that we provide as a basis and will continue to provide into the future. Uh, the golden model is based on sale. Sale uh, is done by Cambridge. And, and we have a, a very good partnership with them and working on, on enhancing sale, sale documentation, et cetera, uh, along the way. Um, uh, you know, if you go above it, it's a pretty obvious stack. I mean, obviously, you can go into a lot more detail, various levels. But you know, uh, it, you know I, I, I kind of want to give uh, like like money to somebody who knows which icon on there doesn't belong. Uh, I actually grabbed this from somebody else, and and it's uh, the plus sign after Open SBI. It's actually Open SBI plus Uboot or Open SBI plus UEFI. Um, <clears throat> But uh, you can see, I mean, it's it's all the things that you would expect, and there's more. I mean, we, we didn't put everything on here because things just don't fit. A uh, huge amount of operating systems that are uh, going to RISC-V. Uh, but, you know, as, as Philip said, you know, you, you know, once you have the ISA, you need all this stack in order for, for um, people to actually use this somewhere, right? Uh, sometimes it's something simple like an earbud, and it's a custom RTOS and a uh, custom application, and they're not going to use a whole lot of this. Uh, sometimes it's a data center server, and they're going to use everything on here, right? So, uh, so it, it really varies depending on the workload and the, uh, the, the uh, deployment. The left are tools, right? And uh, a growing amount of tools here, um, a lot of discussion about simulators, um, um, you know, performance modeling, et cetera. Uh, on the right are uh, attributes, right? These are things that everything needs to uh, to do, right? Things need to be debuggable. They need to be secure. They need to be performant, right? Uh, and then reliable, serviceable, diagnosable. So uh, we work in a lot of the committees to make sure that these pieces are in place and that the software ecosystem pieces that do these things are in place. Um, the bottom, the green piece, are things that we don't do, but we work with other groups to do it. So you see uh, low risk on here. I know uh, somebody was from low risk here I, I saw the other day. Uh, Chips Alliance, uh, open hardware, <clears throat> they, uh, a lot of them have full designs, full DV, full RTL. You can just take it off the shelf. Plus, there's a bunch out there beyond that, things like Rocket and other things. Uh, so all this stuff's available. Um, we don't do it because we keep a separation between implementation uh, dependent and implementation independent. Chris has a very strong uh, culture of making sure that we aren't favoring anything, but we work really closely with them. We enable them. We want to make sure it's successful because we know that's the way members are successful. We have some joint working groups. We have a joint working group with uh, Chips Alliance on coherency. Um, and then the stuff in the white around the outside are things that people sell. And uh, it's dependent on all these pieces. And then the software stacks. I, you, you know, uh, part of my job is to go ahead and recruit people to, to the contributor culture and, and help. Uh, so sometimes I, I, I throw slides up there like, you know, I need help here. I need help here. I need help here. And it's easy to get panicked and glass half empty. Uh, the glass is half full. This stuff is all available. It works, right? This is not like what we want to do. This is what's done. And this is not, again, the, the total list. And you can see it's in all the you know typ typical areas that you might expect, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, we're excited about all this stuff being available, and we want to make sure that, you know, we get more and more stacks. I'm talking with embedded folks. There's, there aren't embedded stacks on here, but we're working on getting an embedded slide that looks just like this. Uh, but we're really grateful to everybody who's done all the work in order to make this happen. So with that, I'm going to hand it to Philip to talk about uh, the, the rest of the ecosystem stuff. Uh, but, you know, I think you've gotten the message over the last uh, 45 minutes, 50 minutes, that 
you know, we, we know there, there is no ISA that's useful without software and without the software ecosystem. And uh, that's what we're here to talk about. Oh, yes. Thanks. So, Mark, first of all, there is no glass. People always panic when the glass is full, when the glass is half empty, or when it leaks. Um, let's just spill the glass because there is no glass. We've had that slide before. Um, so, Risk Five and the software ecosystem. There isn't just one ecosystem. There are so many embedded stacks and so much software. But what you should really expect is if you get software that is not hard, deeply system dependent, you move it over to Risk Five. it will just work out of the box. It might not be as optimized as it could be. It might use generic C functions and portable implementations, but pretty much everything we're seeing is you move it over and unless there's a serious bug in our implementations, in our libraries, in our compilers, it will just work. And that is really the state we're in and everything else is optimization work. Unfortunately, we've gone the first 20% of the, or the first 80% of the way, we have functional completion. And now let's see how long the last 20% take. Uh, but fortunately, it's not a showstopper. Um, so in terms of ecosystem, what, what we're trying to do here is, is something very, uh, where we need. So we, We've heard a lot about ecosystems and workflows for the chip development, about the, the platforms you're taping out on, uh, or how many cores you can fit into specific processes. Um, we're trying to do something similar for software. So again, let's assume pretty much everything runs out of the box. It may just not be as fast as it could. Uh, so what is the next step? Developing the tools and making sure that the tools work, that we can actually make things as fast as they could be as easy as they could be. And that's where our end-to-end -end workflow is going in and where we've been starting a lot of groups recently, bringing a lot of people aboard um, in order to get an end-to-end -end performance workflow. Uh, we want to model the performance of the devices. Um, for the hardware developers, this is about predicting the performance, but it's also for the software developers to predict the performance of our loop kernels, to figure out how fast is the compiler we're working on going to be on any specific hardware without going to the hardware. Um, doing that for libraries as well. So performance modeling is not just a hardware topic and that's why we have it, not under SOC infrastructure, but under the software HC uh, with a dotted line over there. So the goal of the efforts that we have is to establish a performance modeling framework for Risk Five with all of the tools around it that allows us to predict performance of software applications without going down to the hardware. We are working with partners or some of our member companies to get the basic framework. So we have Sparta. Um, this was donated by sci Five, if you so want. So they helped us change the, the license. Their lead author is working for them. And that is giving us a framework. We have BC working on some of the uh, simulation stuff. We've seen the Coyote presentation. Uh, was it yesterday or two days? Time is a blur. Uh, when you're having fun, time is a blur. Uh, but thanks, Borja. So, so great work on your team. And we've had some, some discussions on the site. There are modeling tools available in our community that we can bring to the table, that we can add to this, and that will allow us to have a leading performance modeling and visualization story. Once we have performance modeling done or in parallel, we need to get our performance analysis story going. So performance monitoring for some use cases is something we're working on and where we are forming new initiatives. This means how do we get the performance monitors out of there for the applications that matter to our customers? How do we do that in a virtualized environment, in a metered environment in the data center? So there's going to be some software-driven hardware changes coming up. And of course, analysis tools, visualizing traces, capturing traces, directing the software effort towards the points where it hurts most. Um, I could tell you stories. So I'm managing a team that is working on compilers mainly and performance. Um, 
we can't work on everything. So what is the biggest pain point? Where are we spending the cycles? Where are we spending the cycles relative to other instruction sets? Where could we spend fewer cycles? And having good performance analysis tools is really the key to finalizing our software ecosystem. We found issues on the compilers where simple plumbing was missing in order to enable optimizations. Um, regressions on upstream compilers because conversions were done the wrong way. Similarly, mechanisms that not, were not working in, in libraries, all just by benchmarking and doing comparison. So having good performance analysis tools is going to focus our entire ecosystem. And that's why we've started up that group. So these are really two groups, two six that are going on at the moment um, that are trying to identify all the gaps, come up with a work plan and deliver actual tools within months, a few more months and sometime next year. And finally, one of the biggest efforts that we have, and all of this flows into it, is code speed. We have some of the best foundations to build performance applications. We can add instructions. We can change our ISA. We have pretty much everything in open source. So we can touch it all. We can do actual co-design in order to get the performance out. And the one effort that we're trying to spin up, that we've been working over the last half year to get started is code speed. A cross-company effort to optimize for the RISC-V ecosystem to get the best code quality out of their tools, to have proper optimized support in the libraries, and have really competitive performance out there. Because it's not just one corner case, it's your industry standard benchmark, it's your custom application. In the end, everything that's being done in RISC-V needs to be funded somewhere. And it's going to be funded eventually by selling systems and selling chips. So we as an open source community, in order to make sure that we get funding in the future, need to keep an eye out on what our users, the people, the adopters, the people who actually make silicon based on what we do, need in order to sell these products and be successful with it. So the end-to-end -end performance workflow is, is one of those things that are very dear to me because, well, my background plus market needs. So it's one of the defining factors of where software and especially the applications and tools HC that has been split out is moving. The other aspect, and I touched on that just, just before, that is quite unique to RISC-V and to building our ecosystem is we have modularity. Modularity is great. Adopters can make very small cores, can leave off features that are just taking silicon area or taking power and optimize for the application. So probably one of the reasons why we are so successful in applications like wireless uh, headsets today and other handhelds because you can customize, you leave things off, you add other things on. But that is an enormous challenge to software. Unfortunately for us on the software side, the work is not done when the silicon is here, but it really starts. Um, and doing that for one piece of silicon would be easy. Hey, you know exactly what's in there, you support it properly, you're done. The only problem is there's lots of pieces of silicon coming out from lots of vendors. So we have this modular ISA, which is a defining factor of RISC-V. Um, but it's also very challenging to software implementers and tools vendors. Uh, so we have this modular ISA, which is a huge opportunity for us. And then we have vendor-defined extensions. Um, you've heard this about the third times in me saying today, vendor defined extensions, X extensions, custom extensions, because this is where RISC-V is heading. This is where RISC-V has its value. It's not just for legacy stuff where people didn't want to wait for standards to come out. It's especially for application specific things that vendors might not want to fully open for application specific uh, usages where vendors say, well, this only matters to us. So yes, we're going to publish it, but who's gonna 
adopted. I mean, we were talking about things like that yesterday uh, when it came to some of the code size improvements, when we were talking about zero overhead loops. Uh, so all of that goes into the vendor-defined extensions bucket. And here, a lot of community work is needed because people are only interested in solving their problem. They are not necessarily interested in how to get this upstream, how to get this generally supported. And even if so, they want to have the least in effort. And the only way we can make this easy for them is by defining the ground rules early so that they design the right way, that their documentation already names the instructions in a way that is acceptable, that they publish this, <coughs> and that they provide us with the necessary patch set so we can move it upstream. So as a community, we need to be friendly towards these custom extensions. As a community, we need to set down the ground rules, be a bit forward-looking, and have the environment. And we're there now. We've, we've got most of this done. Yeah, there's some corner cases there, like what do we do with vendor-specific relocations? Um, that will need to be addressed over the next couple of weeks and months. But we have the basic infrastructure ready. <coughs> So, on top of that, tools and simulators. Um, we've been talking a lot about them. We have the sale model, we have Spike, we have QEMU. Um, we have publicly demonstrated and documented tools, but what, what this is really about is focusing our effort. Um, as an ecosystem, we are still doing too many things at the same time and, and losing focus. We have two functional simulators with Spike at QEMO. Uh, we have the sale model half finished. We have the old tests. We, we need to integrate all of this into one consistent story. One functional simulator, one golden model that is integrated with our specifications. So it's a readable model that feeds into sale. Um, have the risk five profiles of all of them and have the architecture compatibility tests and all of that working in unison. And finally, again, I mentioned it before, we have a dynamic discovery story to, to, to solve because in order to realize these benefits, we need to get custom extensions discovered. We need to have rules and methods of how to handle that. So they get reported the software doesn't know about it, what do we do? The software should still continue running without those additional features. But if it's a profile or a mandatory feature from a profile, well, you can throw an error because you can assume it's there. So all of that is really organizational work, standardization work that's going on in Risk Five International that I welcome everybody to join, that I ask everybody to join because this is where we need to build consensus. Yes, after that, once we have consensus, there's going to be some coding, and the coding is going to be fun, and seeing it work is going to be fun. But we first need to talk about it, and we need to come to some consensus, and that's what we as a software HC and our six do. And I can only invite all of you into there because we have way too few people participate, way too few people contribute in the discussions, which leads to a lot of solutions that then need to be revised because we didn't talk about it first. So, that said, um, let's go back into that slightly self-congratulatory -con mode because this is a conference. Uh, we haven't really met uh, a lot over the last couple of years and a lot has been, has been happening. And I really consider OpenJDK one, one of the biggest successes we've had recently. Um, just having gotten this merged is big. So, right now, we have the infrastructure to run Java applications out of the box. So what I was saying at the beginning, what Mark was showing with the, with the ecosystem stack and the software stack was probably for 80%, 90% of software applications, you just put them on RISC-V, they will run. Well, that was true for C applications and C++, mostly for Fortran too. Uh, but Java, what do you do if you do not have a Java virtual machine? Java was missing a good part of the enterprise software stack. A good part of the data center stacks is written in Java. So having Java on our platform today 
is a big thing and it's one of the biggest achievements and this was entirely vendor contributed. So these people were just showing up at meetings, letting us know they were working on it, but this was basically two member companies doing all of the work, going out to OpenGDK, getting this upstream. Uh, so a big thank you to, to everybody who was involved in that effort and I can only ask you as members to try this out, to see what's missing, to give them feedback so that when OpenGDK 19 comes out, this really supports whatever you're doing as well. So finally, another big announcement that came out recently. Um, again, I alluded to it before. We have Android 12 running on RISC-V hardware. So there are RISC-V boards. There's a logo on it in case you're wondering which vendor. Um, they have Android 12 running. There are some components missing, but generally it is there. You can play back videos. You have the connectivity. Some of the peripherals may be missing. They don't have the, the, the um, phone integration yet. But this is moving forward. We are passing, what is it, about half of the tests at this point. Uh, from the last status update. Um, there are some fringe features that are missing and people are just working towards that. Um, this work is mainly taking place in China, uh, aimed at customer electronics, but the big news is we have it. It's working for IT use cases. It's working for headless use cases. It's working for graphics use cases. And Android is coming to risk five. So, Another big announcement from the last couple of days, RISC-V is getting adopted uh, for an, an open hardware, uh, for a developer-focused and education-focused hardware. So think of that of your old TI calculator on steroids. A nice little 10-inch display, a full keyboard, Linux running on it. Um, I know there's, there's, there's going to be an additional version coming that has some additional IDs, some GPIO connector and a, uh, a tiny printer integrated, but this is an educational tool. And this is an educational tool that will be running on RISC-V with a full Linux stack and a full graphics stack. In other words, get it, put it in the classroom and start playing around with RISC-V. And finally, the big question that everybody is asking themselves and the one where I'm wondering, Mark, if we'll be able to pull this off, will we see the first RISC-V laptop announced this year? So there's a mystery laptop pictured on the right. And I'll just leave you all with the question, might there be RISC-V in this one already? And are we going to come to conclusion this year, even with the chip shortage and everything, on getting RISC-V multi-core, two gigahertz class support onto our laptops? Thank you. <laughs>